Hello, ladies, gentlemen, teachers, students, gather round, gather round. We are in the library of the Garrick Mock Monastery, and Fodlin Story Hour with Manx is just about to begin. So grab yourself a nice cup of coffee, cocoa, or whatever beverage you might prefer. It might be an ice cold Pepsi Max or Monster. Hmm. And enjoy as we delve into Fodlin lore. So, um, the moment I saw the library, or the, the moment I read about the library in a Famitsu article, I knew that I would want to spend a lot of time here. I am a big lore hound. The thing is, when me and Mecha do our regular Let's Plays, I feel like we hardly have enough time to do anything. Like, the 30 minutes just goes by like that, and it's over. Um, and I can't just sit and read books during a Let's Play. I mean, some people might enjoy that, but I don't think everyone would. But for me personally, I could just stay here for hours and read books on lore, and that's exactly what this series will be all about. Now, when you enter the library in the Garak Mak Monastery, you will be presented with a nice visual of books to read. And I do believe that more books will unlock as you play through the game. And in these books you can read the history of Fodlan and other nice legends, and I for one would love to know more about the Fodlan lore, so in this particular series we will just be reading books. Now, you can treat this sort of like an audiobook with Manx, I guess, if you're interested in the lore, but you don't really have the patience to sit and read it yourself. I personally listen to a lot of audiobooks. I think it's very soothing, very pleasant. It's a very pleasant way to consume books. I read a lot too, but I also listen to audiobooks. So, uh, you can sort of watch this on the sidelines if you're interested. It will go side by side as I unlock more books. I'll come back here and I'll read more. I think currently we've uh, unlocked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... 10, 11 books should be plenty of things to read on our first go through. So, I say we begin with the history of Fodlan. And we have two parts so far. I'm not sure if more parts will be unlocked. Maybe you guys can tell me in the comment section if, uh, if there's a way to unlock more books. If you can find them in a monastery or whatnot. I, I've sort of been avoiding reading too many guides or going on the internet because I don't want to get spoiled. So, let us begin, ladies and gentlemen, with the history of Fodlan, part one. <clears throat> Under the tyranny of ruthless disorder, the people endured a long period of suffering. The vile nemesis, who proclaimed himself the king of liberation, delighted in war and bloodshed. Rather than rebelling against his persecution, the people of Fodlan fell to his debt in a mad scramble to attain power through murder and theft. Forty-one years before the founding of the Adrestian Empire, St. Cyrus appeared in the land of Enbar, and, through the many unfantable miracles she performed, spread light across the land. In doing so, she joined the shattered hearts of the purest people of Fodlan, who went on to form the Holy Church of Cyrus. Imperial Year One, the founding of the Adrestian Empire. In the first year of our calendar, the glorious Adrestian Empire was founded. Its name was gifted by an oracle, and its future blessed by the goddess. Its capital, Enbar, was chosen to govern the southern reaches of Fodlan, where the divine saint Cyrus also lent her power. Imperial Year 32 The War of Heroes Wilhelm Paul Hresfeld the inaugural Adrestian Empire, or Empire, raised an army in pursuit of the unification of Fodlan. With his might, he hunted and destroyed any house's territory that dared to seek more power. Imperial Year 46, the Battle of Gronder. An intense battle erupted on Gronder Field where the houses that were allied with Nemesis and the Imperial forces of the Adrestian Empire clashed. There, the Imperial forces emerged victorious. Imperial Year 91, the Battle of Teltian. The house that were allied with Nemesis once again faced off against the Imperial forces, this time at the Teltian Plains. There, the evil Nemesis finally fell, and the Empire secured a momentous victory. Imperial Year 98, the War of Heroes ends. The successor to Great Emperor Wilhelm I, like Slyceon I, succumbed to sudden illness. 
The Empire, which ruled over the majority of Hoedland, took this opportunity to put an end to the seemingly endless fighting. Now one thing that I will point out is that it's very obvious that these books are written by the Church of Seros. I personally don't think Nemesis is the evil guy that he's portrayed as. He may actually be pretty evil, but I think there's two sides to the story. You can very, very clearly tell that like a priest of Seros wrote this because it's like, oh, the, the good church and the evil Nemesis and the church was good and Nemesis was bad and the church was good, you know. <laughs> so, again, interesting story though. Uh, I think the Tiltium Plains, that's what we saw in the initial battle where we saw Seros fight Nemesis. So that's cool. Nice reference. All right, let's continue with the history of Fodlan part two. <clears throat> Imperial Year 721, the first mock war. The Dagdan army invaded from across the sea. Through the Imperial forces resisted... Oh, my bad. Though the Imperial forces resisted the attack and drove off the enemy, the land of Mock sustained considerable damage. Imperial Year 728, the invasion of Bridget. The Empire invaded the Bridget Archipelago, a land occupied by allies of Dagda. As penance for their refusal to surrender, the people of Bridget were relegated to a life of imperial subjugation. Imperial Year 731 The Invasion of Dagda With the boon of a strong foothold in Bridget, the Empire mounted a large-scale invasion of Dagda. However, the fortunes of war were not on their side, and their attack failed. Imperial Year 747, the Fargus Rebellion. Log, a descendant of one of the houses that first quarreled with the Empire, raised an army to demand independence, pulling the land of Fargus into a fierce rebellion. This clash came to be known as the War of the Eagle and Lion. Imperial Year 751, the founding of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. Lug and his resistance army were victorious over the Imperial forces. The Holy Church of Syros meditated between the two, and Fargus secured its hard-won independence as the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. Imperial Year 801 The Leicester Rebellion A rebellion broke out in the Imperial lands of Leicester, which the Imperial army was unable to suppress. The Holy Kingdom, viewing the uprising as an opportunity to increase its own political sway, occupied the Leicester region, formally declaring it as territory of Fargus. Imperial Year 861, Fargus divided. Following the death of King Klaus I, three princes became archdukes and split the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, that they may rule over its three separate territories. Imperial Year 881, the Crescent Moon War. The Archduke, ruling over the Leicester region of the kingdom, succumbed to illness. The lords of the Leicester lands refused to acknowledge the next Archduke in line, instead plotting to rule jointly as an alliance. Imperial Year 901 – The Founding of the Leicester Alliance The Leicester Alliance was officially formed after the subjugation of hostile nobles and the removal of all opposing forces in the regions of Fargus. An influential figure from the outset, Duke Regan was inarguably the heart of the newly formed alliance. Imperial Year 961 – The Almerian Invasion The great eastern nation of Almeria crossed through Fodland's throat and invaded Alliance territory. The Empire dispatched troops in order to help conquer these threats, and the attackers were just barely driven off. Imperial Year 1101 the construction of Fodland's Locket. To defend against future Almerian invasions, the Alliance, the Kingdom, and the Empire joined their efforts and resources to construct the indomitable fort known as Fodland's Locket. So a lot of really cool references here. I like that the leader of the Bridget Archipelago was named Dagda. That's a clear reference to Tracia 776. Bridget, of course, being Abel and Tracia, and Dagda being one of the warriors that joined early on. I mean, that, that, that can't be a coincidence. They love their references too much for this to be a coincidence. I also like how there's a lot of tension between the countries from the get-go. You can tell that there's a big... We have a long history of war. It started off as one holy kingdom, and then Fargus rebelled and broke away, creating its own nation. And then there was some internal struggle in Fargus, and then the Leicester Alliance rebelled, forging, forming the Leicester Alliance. So 
there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of conflict in the pasts in in, in Fodland, and you can really tell that there's sort of a what I really like about Dimitri Edelgard and Claude as characters and how they tie nicely into the story is that you can really tell that they're not really best friends. They're more like rivals. The way they talk to each other, the way they interact in the cutscenes. They're not buddy, but it's not Eliwood, Hector, and Len. Not at all. This is... They are... They see each other as opposing rivals and potential enemies. You can really tell by the way they constantly feel the need to take jabs at each other. Even Dimitri, who's all honorable, is very like... There's a tension there that I really like, and you can... You can really tell that they put a lot of uh, thought into the writing of this game. So yeah, let's. Uh, we're done with the history of Fodland. Let's uh, see what's over here. So here we have the Traveler's Journal. Uh, this is the second issue, so I assume this might be the first. Mm, let's see what this is. Traveler's Journal, issue one. A record consistently... Oh, sorry. <clears throat> it's a bit hard to get this done on the first go. A record consisting largely of the world outside of Fodlem. The, the author's identity is unknown, but they have already experienced these places firsthand. Hmm. Almeria. A great kingdom to the east of Fodlem. Its territory borders that of the Leicester Alliance. With a precipitous mountain mountainous range known as Fodlem's Trode acting as the dividing line. Its people maintaining a strong legacy of horsemanship and relish in the thrill of battle. This vast kingdom is rich in fertile prairies, deserts, and mountain ranges. Albania, a continent to the northwest of Fodlum. Its frigid climate is home to numerous rare and valuable species of flora and fauna. However, the human population there is extremely small due to the intense cold on the frozen earth, which is unsuitable for growing grains or other food crops. Morphus. Morphus is the name of a metropolis of magic to the southeast of Fodlan, as well as the boundless desert that surrounds it. In the distant past, it was called the City of Illusion, thanks to an intricate web of trading routes. Rumors of its profound and mysterious magic continue to spread. Dagda, a continent to the southwest of Fodlan. Due to its extreme distance from Fodlan, rumors of this relatively unknown world abound. Some claim it's a tropical rainforest, while others insist it's merely a giant frozen plateau. In truth, this vast continent stretches far into the north and south and supports a wide variety of terrain and climates. Okay, so Dagda is actually a different nation. It's not the leader of the Bridget Archipelago. That was my bad. Uh, also, more or less totally inspired by Kadeen right here. So, these are distant lands that we probably won't be visiting, but we do know that in the DLC, there's going to be additional routes opening up. So, they're really... They're laying the groundworks for a lot of different continents to be added in future DLC, which I really like. So, let's see. Traveler's Journal, Issue 2. A record consisting largely of... Okay, well, we've already read this. So let's continue with Bridget. An archipelago nested between Fodlan and Dagda. It is a land of plenty that is often heralded as the perfect union of the gentle sea and nature's bounty. Both Fodlan and Dagda have long viewed to claim this territory as their own. Sreng. Sreng was once the name of an enormous peninsula to the north of Fodlan. Today, only the northern half has kept the moniker, while the southern half now falls under the dominion of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. Several warlike clans call this great wasteland their home. C certain areas of this region are comprised of rocky desert. Duskur, that's where um, Dedu is from. A peninsula to the north of Fodlan and the west of Sreng. The people who once inhabited this area were decimated, and it now falls under the dominion of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. The land boasts nothing noteworthy to make it a desirable travel destination, but rumors of valuable minerals waiting to be unearthed abound. Ogma Mountains An enormous mountain range, somewhat south of central Fodlan. To the west it forms the border between the Empire and the Kingdom, surrounding Garakmok and cutting across the Empire territory. It is home to many animals and plants that cannot be found elsewhere, as well as a plethora of valuable mineral deposit deposits. Not the disposits. So again, lots of references there. Ogma, yeah. Well, you know what that means. Okay, so we got, we got quite a few books left. I have to wonder if the second floor will be made available at some point. I mean, there's a stairway going up there. Uh, but it's closed, so we can't really go there right now. So uh, I'm very curious to see that myself, personally. Alright, let's read a little bit about the Sarah, shall we? But first, I need some refreshments. Mm-mm-mm. 
I do hope you're enjoying this. I am really enjoying this personally. Like reading lore, one of my favorite things to do in video games. I'm the kind of guy who will read every single lore book when I play on my own. Not when I let's play, because that might annoy people. The Book of Seros, Part 1. The Revelation. The goddess is all things. She is heaven above and the land below. She is eternity incarnate. She is the present, the past, and the future. Her eyes see all. Her hands receive all. That's what she said. Okay. Nope. Wait until you're done, Manx, before you make the comments. She who graced with the holy word of the divine goddess, who bore witness to her magnificence, is the one called Seros. She is the messenger of the heavens, the bridge between the lands. Above and below, her and all and her blessings shall bring tidings of peace to all. With the goddess omnipotence and wisdom to guide her, Seros ensure that her will be done. As the goddess sword, Seros wards away evil. As the goddess's child, Seros makes emperors of mortals. As the goddess's wings, Seros evaluates her people. As the goddess's voice, Seros spreads the words of love. That sublime sword is entrusted to you. Those emperors are crowned before you. Those wings clear your path. That voice whispers words of trust. May the blessing of the goddess follow you always. Yeah, so we get it. Seros is great. Kinda surprising that uh, a monastery dev devoted to a religion would have books praising the goddess. Who's that, by the way? Oh. Uh, I think that's... Ah, oh, Thomas is over there. My webcam is blocking the minimap, so I can't see who else is here. <laughs> okay, more goddess worship. The Book of Seros, Part 2. The Creation. In the beginning, amid the great cloudless ocean, Fodlan came to be. At the end of a long journey, the goddess glimpsed that land and there alighted. Upon that sacred ground, she breathed life into the world and created all the creatures upon it. By the goddess's hand, plant took root, birds took to the sky, an animal roamed to the land. Last of all, she created humanity. When the humans wished for power, she granted it. She gifted them all the blessings of the heavens and of the earth. By way of the magical arts, humanity gr attained great power, yet unaware of the great power portrays great evil. The Creation In the beginning, amid the great cloudless ocean, Fodlan came to be. At the end of a long journey, the goddess glimpsed that land and there alighted. Upon that sacred ground, she breathed life into the world and created all of the creatures upon it. Okay. Alright. By the goddess's hand, plants took root. Bird took to the sky, and animals roamed the land. Last of all, wait. Oh, wait, I already read this, my bad. <laughs> there you go. By the grace of the goddess's divine protection, humanity thrived. Through her blessings, they grew prosperous and their numbers rose. Before long, they became the most powerful creatures in all of Fodlan. All was well until darkness descended from the north. A darkness that devoured the earth, desecrated the heavens, and threw the world and its inhabitants into a state of chaos. To face this evil force, the goddess created a new well of power. She gifted certain chosen individuals with sacred blood, allowing them to wield mystical weapons that they may prevail against the darkness. These souls, bowing their divine gifts, conquered the evil ones and drove them back to the north. They came to be known as heroes. The heroes experienced unnaturally long lives, persisting for hundreds of years. Even after they breathed their lasts, their power coursing through their blood remained, leaving an indelible mark upon this world. Their power, passed through bloodline, came to be known as the Crests. The mystical weapons they once wielded are now called the Hero's Relics, and so the legend of a new age was born. The descendants of the heroes sought their ancestors' power, and thusly their blood. In time, they, they amassed Crests, Relics, Land and Wealth, using all to set the land aflame with war. The goddess's power, intended to stem the flow of evil, became a tool of destruction, all because of the greed of humanity. The goddess grieved, heartbroken, hid herself in the heavens from when she came. So you can really say, you can really tell how greatly inspired the lore of this game is from Genealogy of the Holy War. This is basically the miracle of Darna, although there is that little twist at the end where the goddess basically like is ashamed of her creation and goes into hiding. That part is not really part of genealogy lore, but the one that comes before that, the goddess descending, blessing the mortals, giving them a power to fight the evil, that is basically genealogy lore in a nutshell. 
Alright, let's uh, see what's over here, shall we? Shut up, I'm trying to read here. Let's see. Come on, thanks. Oh, yay, another Book of Zeros. The Five Eternal Commandments. Dare not doubt or deny the power or existence of the goddess. Dare not speak the goddess's name in vain. Dare not disrespect your father, mother, and any who serve the goddess. Dare not abuse the power gifted to you by the goddess. Dare not kill, harm, lie, or steal, unless such acts are committed by the will of the goddess. The goddess cares and protects all that is beautiful in this world. The goddess will never deny the splendors of love, affection, joy, peace, faith, kindness, temperance, modesty, or patience. Follow her example, and in doing so, abide her laws. Alright, so be nice, worship the goddess, and so forth. So we have uh, four books left to read. Let's see what this is. So we have the Kingdom Nobles. I'm just making sure I'm reading these in the correct order. Uh, Register of the Alliance Nobles. Empire Nobles. And Empire. Okay, so these. I think this is Fargus, Lester, Adrestian. I think that's how it goes. Let's uh, begin with the Adrestian one, since we're picking the Black Eagles. There we go. Reg Register of Kingdom Nobles. A register of prominent nobles from the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. Oh, okay, Fargus. This document is expressly for official use by the Church of Ceros. Students are forbidden to remove or, per or peruse this documentation. 1179 edition. Okay. House Bladed. That's where Demetrius is from. This house claims Bladed of the Ten Elites as, an, as, an, as its ancestor. It has ruled the kingdom for over 400 years. Ever since Lug, the King of Lions, claimed victory in the War of the Eagle and Lion in 751, this secured the kingdom's independence from the Adrestian Empire, after which Lug was crowned as its inaugural king by the Church of Syros. House Bladed resides in Firidad, the kingdom capital, claiming all of the surrounding territory as its domain and many of the fieldoms in the north of Fodlan as its vassals. With the passing of King Lambert in 1176, his older brother, Grand Duke Rufus of Aitha, assumed the burden of ruling the kingdom in the young crown prince's stead. Even still, strife and disorder continue to plague the land. House Fraldarius, I do believe that's where Felix is from. This house of dukes claims Fraldarius as the ten elites of, it, of, of the ten elites as its ancestor. It is one of the most ancient houses on record, even among the kingdom's nobility. It is said that Kaifon, the sword fiend of Lug, the king of lions, was also related to the hero Fraldarius. House Gautier. Who's Gautier? Um... Gautier. Wait. Hmm. Gautier. Who's that again? I'm not sure. I, I, I got it on the tongue. Like, Gautier, Gautier. Is that Lorenz? It's either Lorenz or Ferdinand. I don't remember. This house of Margraves claims Gautier of the Ten Elites as his ancestor. His territory lies in the northeast mount reaches of the kingdom. As such, it has safeguarded kingdom territory against incursions by the people of the Strength region for over 200 years. House Charon. This is Lysithius' house, I think. This house of contains claims Charon, uh, Charon, sorry, it's not Charon, it's Charon, of the Ten Elites as his ancestors. Tasked with negotiating between the Resistance Army and the Church of Ceros during the War of the Eagles and the Lion, the head of House Charon continues the tradition of a ceremonial competition within the kingdom. House Galatea, that is Ingrid's house, I believe. Yeah, her name is Galatea. When House Daphnel, once a cornerstone of the Leicester Alliance, was divided in two over an inheritance feud, half of them defected to the Fargus and established House Galatea, which was granted the noble title of Count. Much of its territory consists of a frigid wasteland, where a severe famine occurred in the early 1170s. House Roe. No idea who this is. A noble house that once held territory in the Northern Empire. When the fortress city of Ironhord was constructed within its domain, it revolted against the Empire and pledged the entirety of its territory, including Ironhord, to the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. For this contribution, it was awarded the noble title of Count. House Clyman. This house originally held no more than a lordship over a single castle in the west of the kingdom, but it was awarded the noble title of the Viscount for its great success of the subjugation in the Descour region in 1176. Afterwards, it was granted the Descour region as its feudal estates. 
I wonder if this is where uh, Asha's adoptive father, Lord Leonardo, is from, because I know he rules like a single castle, so could be. All right, let's uh, take another sip. Mm -mm. Ah. Let's read some more books, shall we? Register of Alliance Nobles. A register of prominent nobles from the Leicester Alliance. This document is expressly for... Yeah, okay, we know. Don't, don't steal, basically. House Regan, so that's Claude's family. The leading house of the Leicester Alliance and descendants of one of the ten elites. In the Crescent Moon War of 881, they spearheaded the move towards independence from the kingdom, as well as the establishment of a republic by its former vassals. They have held the esteemed responsibility of leading the Alliance roundabout ever since. The position of this house of dukes relies on the noble rank bestowed upon it by the kingdoms. Well before the alliance's founding, the current duke Regan's heir, Godfrey, died in an accident while on duty. While he did leave behind a surviving daughter, she is presently unaccounted for. House Goneril. Oh, that is... Oh, that is, that is Lorenz, I think. Either Lorenz or Sylvain, I don't remember. Descendants of one of the ten elites, it is a military house that is chiefly tasked with the military strikes and defenses against the Almerian army, mostly due to its territorial positions in the east. Lord Holst, the next head of the house, is widely renowned as the Alliance's bravest general. House Ordelia, this is also one of, this is both Lysithia and uh, Lorenz's house. A house of counts with land in the east of Leicester's territory. In 1167, it was involved in a House Hrims rebellion, and the Empire retaliated by repeatedly meddling in the House internal affairs, leading to a sharp decline in its noble standing. House Gloucester. I know I said Lorenz a lot, but I think Gloucester. Gloucester. No, this is this is Sylvain, I think. Or is it Ferdinand? I don't remember. <laughs> Gloucester. Gloucester. No, this is Lorenz. This is Lorenz and Lysithia. She has a minor crest of Gloucester and a major crest of Charon, I think. Descendants of one of the ten elites. This house counts hails from the southern Leicester territory. The current head of house is ambitious. Oh, the current head of house is ambitious, excels at. Sorry, that's a very difficult sentence. Let me read that again. The current head of house is ambitious, excels at public relations, and has an influential voice among the five noble families with voting rights at the Leicester Alliance Roundtable, second only to House Regan. House Edmund. A house of Margraves with land in the north of Leicester territory. Its beneficial trade politics, policies, emphasizing fair use of its personal harbors, have awarded the house a great deal of clout. To such a degree that it was eventually accepted into the ranks of the five great lords of the Alliance. The current head of house is a renowned orator. House Daphnel. Ooh, who's Daphnel again? Um, Daphnel, Daphnel, Daphnel. Don't remember right now. Descendants of one of the ten elites and formerly among the five great lords of the Alliance. It lost much power due to internal discord. For the last several generations, no head of house Daphnel has borne a crest. In spite of this, it still maintains its status as a noble family. So this might be Casper, Hubert. No, wait, this is the Leicester Alliance, so it has to be someone from the Golden Deer. I don't remember. Uh, actually, no. There is one. There is one noble in the Golden Deer that doesn't have a crest, but I don't remember who it is right now. Register of Empire Nobles, Part Two. Maybe we should read Part One first. There we go. So yeah, this, these are uh, nobles from the Adrestin Empire. House Hresveli. This is Edelgard's house. The most distinguished noble house of the Empire, tracing its root all the way back to the great Emperor Wilhelm. It has been governing house of the, it has been the governing house of Empire for 1100 years. In addition to the first Emperor, its lineage also traces back to Saint Seros herself, which is why generation of Emperors are believed to bear the crest of Seros, just like Edelgard. House Resvelg resides in the Enbar. Oh, in Embar, the imperial capital, claiming all of the surrounding territory as its domain. It boasted supreme authority both within the Empire and without until the insurrection of the Seven in 1171, in which much of his power was stripped away by the nobility. In recent years, a series of misfortune has plagued the storied house, and some believe dark clouds hover over the future of the Resvelg reign. House Aegir. So, Aegir, who's that again? Aegir.
It's... God damn it, I should know this. A house of duke possessing great power within the empire, second only to House Resvelg. The head of the house came to occupy the post of prime minister, rendering the title a hereditary one thereafter. House Aegir led the insurrection of the Seven and in many ways holds the true power governing the empire. House Vestra, a house of marquesses without a domain, existing in the shadow of House Resvelg. In addition to managing the darker tasks of the empire, it is responsible for the emperor's fire periphery affairs, including coordinating things such as ceremonies and rituals, imperial consorts and the imperial guard. House Vestra was allied with House Aegir in the insurrection. I think this might be Hubert's house? House Hevering, a house that counts, a house of counts that has inherited rule over the empire's domestic affairs, particularly those relating to the administration, finance and the ju judiciary. It frequently clashes with the Minister of Military Affairs over these matters. Much of its territory lies in the Ogma Mountains, and as such, it enjoys the fruit of a lucrative mining industry. House Berglias A house of counts that has inherited rule over the Empire Ministry of Military Affairs. It commands all of the armies that do not directly belong to the Empire. During times of war, the head of the house becomes the Imperial Army's Commander-in-Chief. This territory compasses most of the Empire's made breadbasket. Gondor Field. House Varley, a house of counts that has inherited rule over the Empire's Ministry of Religion, whose main responsibility it is to maintain amiable relations with the Church of Seros. However, due to the estrangement of the Church from the Empire in recent years, it is now more involved with the judiciary, or ju judiciary causing political strife within the Ministry of the Interior. Mm. So you can really tell there's a lot of seeds here planted. They even said that the he that Hesvel grain is dark, so... That indicates that something's up with that guard, but we sort of already knew this. But yeah, like, all of this lore really reveals that shit's about to go down. So here's a part two. House Gerth. A house of dukes that has inherited rule over the Empire's Ministry of Exterior. Diplomacy, foreign relations, and relations between various provinces and the capital fall under its purview. It worked hard to secure the ceasefire that ended both the Bridget and Dagda campaigns. Though complicit in the insurrection, it remains distant from associated houses. House Arundel. Formerly a minor noble house of the Empire, as head of the house, when Volklan's younger sister became betrothed to Emperor Ironius the... I have no idea what that number is. Volkhard was granted the title of Lord Arundel. Having worked closely with House Aegir, House Arundel is seen as one of the chief instigators of the insurrection of the Seven. House Hrim. A house of Imperial Viscounts. Resisting Emperor Ionus's policy of power centralization, he set out to join the alliance and secure independence from the Empire, but was unable to overcome the Imperial Army's intervention. In the aftermath of the house, main genetic line was wiped out. Its current head of house is an adult adoptee. House Nouvelle, a house of Imperial Viscounts in territory of the Western coach of the Empire, coast of the Empire, centered around its namesake harbor city of Nouvelle. The house flourished thanks to its commerce with Dagdar, Albina, and Bridget, and other territories. Even still, it fell ruined to El in 1175 after permitting the combined invading forces of the Dagda and Bridget armies to make landfall. House Ox, a house of imperial barons. Its territory occupies the northern half of the western peninsula known as Fodland's Fangs. The head of the house was lost to Dagda, lost to the Dagda and Bridget War. House Bartels. A house of imperial barons, highly ambitious, it sought out and acquired several crests for its bloodline. In 1176, many members, including the head of the house, died under unexplained circumstances. The deed was attributed to the heir, Emil. As his whereabouts are unknown, leadership of the house fell to their distant relative. Whew, 34 minutes of lore! So, uh, hi, Thomas. Professor? I heard that you may battle alongside Catherine. Even among the knights, she is something special. A holy knight who is able to wield a hero's relic. Still, she can be a mite difficult. I just had to talk to him. He's been standing there staring at me for 30 minutes. So yeah, that was uh, Fodland Story Hour with Mangs. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'm pretty sure more of these books will unlock as I play through the game. So I'll be looking at the comments in the reception of this video. Did you enjoy it? Do you find it interesting? Uh, was my narration good? I, it is kind of hard to read all this perfectly on the first try. It's a lot harder than it may look. 
So uh, yeah, just let me know if you want me to do a part two as soon as more books unlock in the library. I definitely feel like I understand the country of Fodlan a little bit better. The country. The territory of Fodlan a little bit better right now. Uh, they've clearly put a level of effort into writing this game's story that they did not do with the previous games. And I am very happy to see that. There's a deep lore. It connects very nicely to the main story. I feel like I sort of get a sense of the conflict that's about to come. And uh, yeah, and I, I really like how they're laying the foundations for future continents and stuff like that to be expanded with DLC and stuff like that. So really good on them. They've actually put effort into the story of a Fire Emblem game. I am very happy to see it. So anyway, guys, if you enjoyed this part, give it a like and a comment. Let me know what you think. And I'll see you next time for more Fodland Story Hour with Manx.